You need the, the mic. Yeah, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me in this. Oops. <laughs> um, um, as Joe said, I'll be talking about um, many particle systems, and specifically, I'll be talking about um, cluster excited states. So, I'll be talking about how can we get excited states of clusters, atomic clusters, by using hyperspherical coordinates. And this is work done. Um, in collaboration with my student Gabriel Hanna, Chris Green, at Brett, and Brett Esri. Both of them um, are here, Chris and Brett. Um, so let me start off with an outline of my talk. So first, I'll talk about van der Waals clusters and um, talk a little bit about why they are interesting. And um, specifically, um, these clusters show wide amplitude motion. And that's also the reason why Hartree-Fock type approaches or CI approaches typically do not work, at least when we want to go to more than three or four particles. That motivates us or motivated us to use Monte Carlo techniques instead. But typically, Monte Carlo techniques are really um, restricted to treating the ground state. So we have to modify these Monte Carlo techniques such that we can look at excited states. And then I show some results for helium clusters and also make comparisons with um, argon clusters and um, tritium clusters. So let's start off by looking at helium clusters. And I just look at these as a prototype for weakly bound van der Waals clusters. So first of all, the helium-helium interaction, the atom-atom interaction, can be described by only looking at the nuclear coordinates. So you have two helium atoms, and you describe the, the um, potential curve as a function of the interparticle distance. So I, I neglect all the electronic coordinates here and just treat nuclear coordinates. And then helium clusters, so these little droplets, um, can be used as a cold microlab. They have a temperature of 0.4 Kelvin. Um, just as a comparison, the temperature of argon clusters is 30 Kelvin, so about an order of magnitude higher. And experimentally, what you can do is you can take these helium clusters and actually put something inside. In this case here, it's an SF6 molecule. But you can also put other, other species inside, maybe um, species of astrophysical interest um, and other species, for example, the um, water hexamer, which has been um, shown to be stabilized in an, um, as an isomer that's not stable otherwise. So the helium um, beam isolation, isolation spectroscopy can really be used to look at species um, that one couldn't look at otherwise, at least not very conveniently. So if we want to um, use these helium clusters to actually learn something about the impurity here, then we really need to understand the helium environment first. And that's the motivation for um, looking at these helium clusters and really looking at the excitation spectrum of helium clusters. Um, why is this a challenging problem for theory? The main reason is really that these clusters are very floppy. So there's a wide amplitude motion um, involved here. And that really means that we have to develop, develop new um, numerical techniques. So we want to look at low temperatures. So we have a highly quantum mechanical behavior. And that means we have to do many body quantum mechanics. So we need new computational techniques to describe excited states. And here I'll be using hyperspherical coordinates Sorry about that. I'd be using hyperspherical coordinates um, to do this. And um, in a more broader context, you can really look at these clusters as a transition from the atom to the liquid. 
And the goal would be to really develop techniques that we can apply equally well to molecules and to a liquid or a solid or a gas, for example. I mean, that's the ideal case, and we'll never get there. But we want to keep this in mind when we develop techniques to treat clusters so we can really treat small systems as well as large systems within the same theoretical framework. And this is where the Monte Carlo techniques come in. Because basically, both the variational quantum Monte Carlo and the diffusion quantum Monte Carlo technique have been very successful in describing ground states. And as I said, I want to go to um, excited states later on. But to do this, we have to look at the ground state first. So Monte Carlo techniques um, can really solve the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the ground state quite efficiently for as many as 1,000 or so atoms, so 3,000 degrees of freedom. Um, however, one is really restricted to the ground state because the requirement is that the wave function um, has to be nodeless to use these techniques. And here I've just written down the um, Hamiltonian again of our cluster system. So here's the kinetic energy, including the derivatives of all the nuclear coordinates again. And this is just the sum of two-body potentials. We could include three-body potentials and other higher-order potential terms quite easily. That doesn't change the treatment at all. And so for the ground state, one can use the variational quantum Monte Carlo technique. Very briefly, what one does is takes a so-called trial wave function and puts a set of parameters into these trial wave functions, called P here, and then minimizes the energy with respect to these parameters. And that gives an approximation to the ground state. If one wants to be exact, one can use the diffusion quantum Monte Carlo technique. Basically, one goes to imaginary time, called tau here, and propagates to long times to project out the exact ground state. So the diffusion quantum Monte Carlo method is really an exact method for treating the ground state at zero temperature. And just to show you an example, um, before I move on to the excited states, this is the density of the helium trimer that I've shown here. So let's look at the helium dimer first. The well depth of the two-body potential it's about 7.6 inverse centimeters, and the ground state energy is um, really 0 0.00091 inverse centimeters. So it's a very weakly bound system, and that's important here. And that's really where the wide amplitude motion comes in. So these systems are very diffuse. So if you look at the helium trimer, um, it's still very weakly bound this minus 0.087 inverse centimeters, an interparticle distance of 18.1 um, atomic units. So it's huge interparticle distances. And there's most likely only one excited state um, for total angular momentum L is equal to 0. And what I've shown here is just a bunch of snapshots that I've taken from the Monte Carlo calculation and in red, I've indicated one possible configuration of the helium trimer. Um, another one would be just some, something like this, for example. It really gives you an idea of how diffuse this helium trimer is. And um, this is the um, density I'm showing. It is, but I've rotated it such that I always have the biggest overlap with the equilibrium position. So yeah, um, whatever I do, if, even if it's a linear configuration, I rotate it such that it has the biggest overlap with the reference geometry. Um, <clears throat> Not directly, but what I did is I have a, a define a triangle, which is the most probable configuration. And then if I have a, let's say, linear configuration like this, or slightly triangular configuration like, like this, I rotate it such that it has the biggest overlap with my reference configuration. So that really leads to um, three basically distinct points in space. 
And this is just an example for the ground state. And now I want to get into how do we get excited states of these um, van der Waals clusters. I have to you. Uh, we shouldn't get that close to this because you're getting a vibration. So. Oh, why don't I take this off? Yeah, take that off. Shouldn't be near the bed, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. So now we get to. Sorry? <laughs> It's not bad enough being taped by itself. <laughs> so now we get into calculating excited states of these pure van der Waals clusters. And basically, I start off with the ground state Schrodinger equation here. And um, just in general, I write down a basis set expansion using hyperspherical coordinates, where this capital R is my hyperspherical radius, and the omega are the 3n minus 1 hyperspherical angles. And basically, as most of you probably know, is the hyperradius. You can just think about it as a size of the system. So what I've indicated here is how the ch system may change as the um, hyperradius gets bigger. So either you can just get sort of a bigger triangle, or you could even have a breakup of the system into a linear configuration. So the advantage of these hyperspherical coordinates is really that they're sort of quantum chemistry type coordinates or reaction coordinates. Um, and that's really one of their big advantages. So if I take then this expansion here and um, put it back into the Schrodinger equation, um, what I get is um, if I neglect the coupling between um, different channels, is this one-dimensional Schrodinger equation with an effective potential curve here. And that's what we heard in the introduction. It's really one challenge to calculate this effective potential curve by itself for more than three particles, or four, five, six particles. The other problem is really to calculate the coupling between different channels. And I will only focus on calculating these effective potential curves for larger systems in this talk. And furthermore, I really only be looking at the lowest potential curve in this curve in this talk. And the channel coupling is really a completely new story, and it's it's a very challenging story. So I use the diffusion quantum Monte Carlo technique to calculate effective potential curves for more than three particles, and then use these potential curves to get excited states of cluster systems. And just to show you an example, again, I show results for the helium trimer to start off, and then I move on to bigger systems. So here we have the potential curves for the helium trimer as a function of the hyperradius here. And this is the lowest potential curve here. And then we have the higher um, potential curves. And in this case, the calculation is done using B-spline uh, code. So here we can really calculate the higher lying potential curves and also the coupling. And that's not possible once you go to more than three particles. So what you want to note here is that these potential curves um, have a smooth behavior. So there are no jumps or kinks or so in these potential curves. And that's in contrast to um, the argon system I'll be talking about later on. So important is that the um, potential curves here reach the limit, like this potential curve out here at large hyperradius reaches the energy of the, or the binding energy of the dimer in this case. So the um, hyperradius, as it gets big, describes the breakup into a dimer plus an atom. And for the many body case, it would describe the breakup into an n minus 1 particle system and an atom. So let's look at the larger systems. So here's a series of potential curves now calculated using the um, diffusion quantum Monte Carlo technique. Um, the upper curve is for three particles, and then it goes all the way down to 10 particles. And um, on the right-hand side, these limits here are really the binding energies of the next smaller cluster. So for the 10 cluster, that would be the binding energy of the nine atom cluster. And that's the threshold behavior. Since we do have these threshold behaviors, we can also calculate the scattering lengths of the n minus 1 body system with the atom. Um, 
And now we can use these potential curves to really calculate excited states um, in these curves, so for these systems. And these um, excited states that we get, you can really think of as the sort of states that are associated with the breathing mode of the system, where the hyperradius sort of does something like this. And so here I've shown the energy per particle for the helium systems. That's the solid line here. And then the dashed line is the um, excitation frequency, or the energy difference between the first excited state and the ground state for the helium system. And these are really the first estimates of the excited state energy of these helium systems. And we find only one excited state for the larger helium clusters, in an an analogy to the helium-3 cluster, where we only found one excited state. And um, you can now take these um, energies and really compare with the literature. So again, um, these red crosses here are our results for the um, first excited state. And this is the energy as a function of the number of particles. And then in green, I've shown some other um, calculations that I found in the literature. And so basically, our um, red dots here pluses really connect very smoothly with results from the literature. And here on the right-hand side, I've shown um, the same data in a slightly different way. And so you can really think of sort of a um, excitation frequency that looks like this for the helium system. So our calculations really filled this gap between the 20 cluster and the um, 3 cluster and show that it's really a very smooth behavior here. And then this um, blue dotted line is the chemical potential and the fact that these crosses or the excitation lies below the um, chemical potential indicates that these are actually stable. So how does the system look like, or what, what, what does this, this approach give us for the argon cluster? And argon is a lot heavier than helium, so therefore it's a far more compact system. And here on the left-hand side, I'm showing the potential curves for the argon trimer. And remember, before I said for the helium trimer, the curves are very smooth. You don't see any kinks and corners. In this case, you actually do see a first minimum and then a second minimum here. And you can almost think of it as sort of two effective potential curves, one sort of going like this and the second one going like this, and then you have the um, coupling here. And so how does this generalize to more particles? Well, here on the right-hand side, I've shown the um, effective potential curves for three, four, five, and six argon clusters. And again, you can see sort of these jumps in the potential curves here. And we can interpret these jumps as a change of geometry of the system. And we get this by really analyzing the adiabatic um, eigenfunctions. So let's look at the lowest curve of the trimer up here and look at these geometries. So at the first minimum, we have a triangular geometry. And then at the um, second minimum here, the plateau, we just have a linear geometry. So it's really describing the breakup of the system. And then for four particles, very similarly, at the minimum, we have this tetrahedron. And then at the first plateau region, we have sort of one particle move out of the tetrahedron. That's this particle here. And this indicates sort of the motion of the particle. And then as we go further down to the next um, minimum here, um, there's another bond that breaks up. And so basically, we can see the rearrangement of geometries in our effective potential curves. And um, 
Well, argon is an example for a much heavier or more compact system than um, helium. The question is, are there any systems that are more diffuse than helium? And um, the answer is yes. And we looked at spin-polarized tritium clusters. So what I'm showing here is the helium dimer potential curve in red together with the um, potential curve for two spin polarized tritium atoms. That's the curve in blue here. And we don't find any bound state for the um, tritium dimer. And just for comparison, up here I've shown the singlet um, curve together with the triplet curve for the tritium. And you see that the um, potential well for the um, singlet state is a lot deeper. And the singlet state actually supports 27 bound states. So <clears throat> anyways, it turns out that the spin polarized tritium dimer has a negative scattering length. And we also find a Feshbach resonance. And so the question is, there's no bound state for the dimer. Are there any bound states for larger spin polarized tritium clusters? And um, yeah, we do find a bound state there. Actually, for the trimer, we find a halo state. And then if you compare the ground state energetics here, for the, again, this is for the helium cluster, the energy per particle as a function of the number of particles, together with the energies for the spin polarized tritium clusters. And you see that the tri tritium clusters, the spin polarized tritium clusters, which are very exotic systems, high spin state systems, okay. um, you see that the, um, these systems are really a lot more weakly bound than helium. And so one may think that they are more diffuse than the helium clusters as well. And one question that um, we are currently looking at is, can one find a bound spin polarized hydrogen cluster? And um, initial calculations seem to suggest that you need at least 100 particles to form a bound um, cluster of spin polarized hydrogen atoms. But um, who knows? There might not be one, after all, that's still under discussion. But here I'm showing a comparison between the pair distribution for five particles. And um, the red curve is for helium. So this is the interparticle distance. And you see helium has a fairly broad distribution. But then if you compare it with the spin polarized tritium clusters, you see it's even more diffuse. So it's, it's a very interesting system with a high spin state, very diffuse. Um, one may ask about three-body eff effects and so on. Um, so if you think in terms of, well, could one do an experiment for um, tritium or tritium clusters? Well, it's radioactive. And one may think of it would be a good project for a national lab to look at this. Um, <laughs> I'm saying it's interesting to look at the cluster formation and the presence of a magnetic field. And the reason that I think this is interesting is the Feshbach resonance that we found for two um, spin polarized tritium atoms. So what I'm showing here is um, the scattering lengths as a function of magnetic field for two um, spin polarized tritium atoms. And these red dots are our coupled channel calculation here. And you see a fairly broad Feshbach resonance at about 870 Gauss. And so this suggests that maybe not only the tritium cluster formation might be interesting um, in the presence of a magnetic field, but also could one actually form a tritium BC in a dipole trap, for example, and then look at hydrogen tritium mixtures, boson fermion mixtures, and um, so on. Um, but we think that the Feshbach resonance that we found may actually um, help creating such a condensate. And it would be interesting from a fundamental point of view, given that these um, potential curves can actually be calculated using up initio methods. So in summary, um, I think that these Van der Waals type clusters really form a unique environment laboratory. Um, this micro lab um, has to be understood first if one wants to use it to put molecules inside a helium cluster, for example. 
And there's still a lot to do to obtain a complete understanding of doped helium clusters. But the Monte Carlo techniques are well suited to really describe many body systems. And I've suggested a technique to really treat excited states of these um, van der Waals type systems. And as I said, hyperspherical coordinates offer a new approach. Um, we looked at a subset of excited states, which provide us a lot of physical insight through the use of hyperspherical potential curves. But there's still a lot to do in order to get the higher excited potential curves and also to eventually really get coupling between different channels. Thank you very much. Years ago.